awesome episode with Ada today. Her breadth of experience, just the pure number of brands she's worked at is crazy. And I think her approach, it's so clear why she's killing it at Mac. I hope you enjoy today. Remember, if you do enjoy, be a friend, tell a friend, hit that subscribe button. Uh, and thanks, everybody. Enjoy the show. Influencers, inspiration, and Instagram, Instagram, Instagram. This is Earned by Tribe Dynamics. Here's Connor Begley. Welcome to Earned, everyone. I'm joined today by one of the most accomplished marketers in the world at one of the world's most iconic brands, Ada Midishiru Ribois. Um, welcome to the show, Ada. Thank you, Connor. I'm so honored to be here. Thank you for having me. I'm one so of the most iconic shows in the world. <laughs> we are top 10% of podcasts globally. Well, we'll try and keep going, yes. get to top 1%, but yeah, we're doing pretty good. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Um, so for those that don't know Ada, uh, she was born in Bounin in West Africa and moved to France at the age of 14. Uh, after getting her graduate degree at one of the top schools in France, she did some consulting and then 15 years at what is essentially the graduate programs of beauty right at L'Oreal. Uh, then you spent two years as the global head of skin brands at J&J, followed by the SVP of global marketing at Revlon. And then now you are the CMO of Mac Cosmetics, which is, like I said, one of the most iconic brands uh, in the world. Yes, no, so, I am, that's why I'm in a part of who I am, you know, but yeah, yeah. that's pretty much it. That's really unbelievable. And I think what's really interesting for me too, is you only started at Mac within the last year, but from the data that we track, we've always already seen Mac rebound quite dramatically. So out of the top 10 brands that we track and make up, you're now the third best performing brand for 2021, um, which is really good, right? Cause these are all of the top brands in the world in terms of working with influencers and social. So we'll dive into that a little bit later, but congrats, congrats on the progress already. Thank you. Yes. Very excited. Like we're making, you know, the makeup category is actually making a strong comeback too. So we were just positioned to, you know, be ready for when it started. And uh, we, yeah, we can talk about it a little bit later, but you know, we, we did a, a big bet on that and it's paying up. Well, let's, let's talk about that right now. So I was just at the WWD CEO conference or CEO summit and everybody was talking about this makeup rebound, the makeup rebound. What do you think is, what do you think is driving that? And is it, is it um, confined to certain regions, right? Is this affecting, cause you've, you've obviously got a, a very global footprint. Are you seeing this more in the U S than other markets or yeah. Talk to me about what, what you think is driving it and where you're seeing the impact. No, I think there is a post pandemic uh, kind of, aspiration, right? We're not there yet, but I think people are, the world is setting up, uh, settling up for that post-pandemic world. People have been tired to be apart and they just want to return to their lives. Um, they want to celebrate with bright, impactful makeup, among other things. Um, and our big bet, you know, uh, we, we, we were like, okay, you know, we are suffering in the in the depth of the pandemic, but we, we need it to get ahead and to create a recovery plan to ensure that we were there to meet consumer when the moment came. It's happening everywhere. Um, Markets like China have rebounded much sooner. Um, obviously, you follow you know, the closure, the lockdown procedure around the world. Um, and then you have markets like Israel actually also rebounded very well. And you know, EMEA, North America, like times are you know, now rebounding. And you can also link that to the vaccination rate. We're seeing like, you know, correlation mm -hmm. between the market recovery and the vaccination rate. Uh, but yeah. for us, we were ready. And, you know, as the leading authority in beauty trends, we mobilized actually uh, makeup trends, you know, to bring them to life um, with our super large offer uh, in our portfolio and our 13,000 of artists around the world. Um, you know, we've rolled out 30 plus trends uh, over the past six months which we are amplifying across our, you know, our social channel um, um, on Tuesday. You know, you can follow the hashtag Mac trend um, on nice. Tuesdays and you can see uh, what our artists have been up to and creating and what has been inspiring to the, to the public. Um, since launching Mac trend, our share of voice in social has actually grown from 10% to 22%. I think last week we were at 27%. Uh, and the number wow. two brand was like at 12%. So wow. we are owning the conversation. And um, so that's from a trend perspective. And from an innovation perspective, we're also 
um, ramping up our pipeline to continue to surprise and delight our consumer as their needs are changing, obviously. Yeah, those 13,000 makeup artists are quite the quite the tool, right? Or not the tool, but quite the community to have attached to your brand, right? Because I know that for us, when we look at the influencers in the space, so many of them are either current makeup artists or former makeup artists, um, and they really use social media as their platform to become discovered. Um, so how, talk to me about that. Like, how do you guys interact with your makeup artist community? How have you invested in that more recently? What are you seeing in terms of their impact on social? Um, yeah, talk to me about them. Yeah, so, you know, um, we're the first makeup professional brand. Um, so artistry is at the core of what we do. We were created by makeup artists for makeup artists, whether they're pro or beginners, right? Like like yeah. you, you and I, Connor. <laughs> <laughs> so artistry is really at the core of everything we do at Mac, and we really value our 13,000 makeup artists. They're, they're the heart and soul of the brand. They work with us um, uh, through the every step of the product development process. They have a seat at the table. Um, they have incredible insight, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, we do have data and, and analytics that we layer on, but our artists are our boots on the ground, you know, that help us understand where the consumer needs gaps are and where they're evolving, um, the latest backstage trend. We use our artists in over 100 fashion shows um, in Fashion Week around the world. Um, so a great example of this is the, the development of uh, uh, Up For Everything Mascara, which is uh, mm -hmm. which addressed a common complaint of artists we're hearing that the Latin American consumer, the Hispanic consumer overall, um, have their lashes pointing down. And um, mm -hmm. so they're like, you know, like this is a, a easy insight that we need to address. So the SKU was launched thanks to them, like the PD team, the product development team worked with the artists to to really perfect what formula can be good for that. And this queue is now the number one in Mexico and Chile. Whoa. They also cater to the U.S. Latina consumer. So this is an example. Um, I have many others, you know, for instance, in India, our artists were really instrumental in like going like to like very deep into understanding the undertone of the Indian consumer so we can have mm -hmm. the right shade range for the Indian consumer in our foundation range. Um, so what we did, you know, they worked, you know, um, we worked with a senior artist and we tested on consumer in market before we launched globally. So that was like a, a makeup artist um, insight there. Um, and they also play a key role when we think about this continued product, what product needs to stay, what product needs to go. They have their favorite, you know, like from the heart standpoint, <laughs> but they can also tell you why from an artist standpoint, they think that these products are needed, even if, you know, sometimes from a financial standpoint, we cannot see it. Um, so their role is super important. And um, from every, you know, every standpoint, innovation, shade diversity, um, you know, just staying ahead of trend, creating trends, looks. Um, so. Totally. Well, and again, and I think going back to that impact they have on social media, it's huge as well, right? Like when we first started tracking the data way back when, maybe, you know, eight years ago, seven, eight years ago, you know, Mac was the number one brand we tracked for years and years, right? And I think it wasn't necessarily because Mac was investing in social really heavily, but their artists were, right? The artists community that you had built relationships with. Um, going back to that idea of kind of shade ranges and the work that you're doing in India, I think that was part of the way that you actually discovered Mac, right? When you were younger, right? You were going to your, well, you tell the story. I don't want to tell the story for you, right? But I think, uh, you know, they were the brand that helped you out in your own way, right? Yes, exactly. So my personal story with Mac, which was my first, actually the first time I actually used the brand was um, I was quite young. Uh, I was about to get married. I got married in my mid twenties um, and I was living in Paris at the time. And um, I was quite broke, you know, I, you know, today wedding is super <laughs> fancy, like people have an hashtag, they have a makeup parties for the whole like party and everything like yeah. I was like, okay, I'm just looking for like something to give me like a great look for my wedding. So that's all I wanted. So I went in a few department stores in Paris and I went around uh, different counters and I was asking, you know, I'm getting married. I'm looking for a look and product to create this look for my wedding. And most like all brands, 
were like, oh no, sorry, we can't help you. Like, we're very sorry, but we cannot help you because we don't have a shade for you. So uh -huh. at the time, you know, like it's like, it's part of, it, today it feels like very brutal, but like at the time it was part of my day to day of like, you know, being underrepresented. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and underserved, right? Like, so I, yeah. so I, I kind of like bumped into one artist from another brand, which I, I, which was like, oh, you should go to the Mac counter right there. So he sent me to the Mac counter. I was very down, you know, it was supposed to be a happy yeah. moment, but after like five or six no's, I was like, okay, whatever, like, you know, but then the Mac artist sent me at the table, asked me what I wanted. They asked me about myself, where I was getting married, what, what my dress was. And they, they just listened to me and look at my face and help me create the look I wanted. And I walk out of those doors, uh, the door that way, uh, that day with, um, um, you know, like a bunch of products that I was, that I used yep. to recreate the looks for my weddings. I had two weddings actually, one in Africa and one in France. And I created the same look with just different lipstick and, you know, it was Studio Fix Foundation and Studio Fix Powder Foundation. They gave me, you know, a few bunch of lipstick uh, shades that they felt could be good. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, lip liners. And I've been using those products since. I felt so wrapped into, um, it was inclusivity at its best. And I felt like yeah. this was yeah. the best expression of equity for the first time in my life in beauty, whether it was for my hair, or for my, you know, makeup, I felt like a brand was not looking at me like, oh, you know, sorry, like we don't do shades for you because you're not worth our time or, you know, business or whatever it was. Like, I mean, the way it was coming across to me was just, I didn't matter, right? Like, and yeah. for Mac, I felt I mattered. And the, the shades, I mean, the service was fantastic. Right. And it's yeah. still like one of the reasons why people come to, to our stores, because our makeup artists are the best in the world. We invest in them. We train them, um, you know, to be the best makeup artists they can be, but also to face consumer in the way that it's going to be, you know, like very centered uh, on the consumer needs. Um, mm -hmm. So I felt that I found product that I loved at the time I was working for a competitive company, like a competition. Yeah. <laughs> use their products. <laughs> Couldn't buy your own company's products. You're like, guys. <laughs> and, uh, and you know, like today it feels so normal, but it yeah. wasn't. And that's been Mac since inception, like 37 years ago. They mm -hmm. were not, they were always very intentionally inclusive of all skin tones, you know. It's not something that they did because now it's politically correct or politically incorrect not to be. So, yeah, you know, it's yeah. just part of the DNA of the brand. I mean, for me, like the values of Mac, and I'm big about equity and brand equity when it comes to marketing. Um, I think this is a big asset of the brand. And it's for me, like when I started to work at Mac, everybody I've met shared those values, value them wear them as a badge on their, you know, black shirt, um, yeah. and, you know, are extremely passionate about it. Like it's a culture, it's a point of view. It's something we believe in. It's not just a fad. It's not a trend. It's not a politically correct trait. It's not something we must do. It's something we it's always just at do. The core. Yeah. It's at the core. Yeah. I'm excited to see you kind of build the brand equity of Mac over a long period of time, right? Because I feel like you've had such a dynamic career that you've been from brand to brand to brand. And brand equity is a long-term play, right? It's not a short-term yeah. play. It's not about what happens this year. It's how it happens in 10 years or happens in 50 years, right? Um, so I'm really excited for that. I think one of the things, and I think to on the consumer side, like you said, right, that was like a super meaningful connection that you made with the brand at that time. And that sticks, right? It's sticking. It's part of the reason you took the job, I would imagine, yeah. 20 years later. For me, like when I come into a brand like this, I think my first, I, I was extremely lucky that my manager, my, my boss actually asked me to take the first two months to listen. You know, mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. was not into working meetings right away. I was in meetings to listen. And if I had an, like a induction meeting with somebody that was taking precedent on any other meeting on my calendar. So I took the time yep. to meet with as many stakeholders 
as possible um, to build those relationships, uh, get to understand, first of all, understand who they were, you know, why they were working there, what their point of view was, et cetera, et cetera. But also like sitting in meetings and trying to understand where I could add value because the team is extremely talented. Like they were not, I, I told you, this was the number one makeup. It is the number one makeup brand in the world. So they didn't need, need me to kind of fix anything. However, yep. the reason why I was hired was to add value in, in certain domains. And I have yep. had those conversations before I came on board, but I wanted to really um, understand if the conversation I've had were matching with the reality I was facing on the ground. So this is the best gift. I think I will, I'm now like repeating this with my teams. When I hire somebody, I'm like, okay, take your time. It's not great on the team because you want everybody to kind of jump in, but it's so much better for the long term. Um, and also for that person. So I, I listen, I try to understand where I could add value and I started to see pockets of where we could accelerate, where we could shape things further, medium, short, medium and long term, you know, working on the makeup recovery, um, working on our innovation pipeline for the future post COVID, hopefully world. Uh, what does that mean, you know, from a category standpoint, from an innovation standpoint, and also basically double downing on what the team was doing already, which is, you know, accelerating online, like we're a digital first brand. So for us, um, during the pandemic, it was just the opportunity to really like refocus on making sure that we had the right capabilities to really continue to drive strength in digital. So there's a lot of work that needs goes into, you know, obviously creating the right content, having, you know, the right technology, um, two things that we actually, you know, like done, like it's um, virtual trying try-ons. Um, so mm -hmm. this is technology to allow people to really um, be able to shop from afar, from the couch, from the iPads. And our technology is the strongest in the industry, I think, you know. And um, we we met this technology met, was was existing before um, the pandemic for Mac. But during the pandemic, we actually extended the technology to 35 countries and over yep. 800 SKUs, which is, you know, basically a, the, the breadth of uh, what you can find on our online channel. You can try eyeshadows, lipstick. So we've brought this uh, strengthening, you know, the connection with the consumer online, but also thinking of how you merge online and physical. Um, so how yep. do you... Built uh, on the channel capabilities, so VTOs are now in. We have a um, this in some of our few stores, but like we have a innovation labs that we started during COVID in the Queen Center. It's a store you should come. Like the next time you are in New York, I would love to take you there. It's a. I would love to. Come. Yeah, we call it the Red <laughs> Store. It's a store that functions for us like an innovation lab. It's totally mobile first, so it's an, it's inspired by one of the store we had in Shanghai that were built with the WeChat ecosystem. Um, so mobile first, you can come into the store, shop, interact, everything from your mobile. You don't have to speak with yeah. an artist. Of course, we have artists in the store if you do want to, to speak with them, but you can create looks, you know, virtually and then like buy, you know, there is a, uh, an opportunity for you to create your pass um, and, uh, you know, like uh, save the looks you like best, understand what's trending locally, et cetera, et cetera. So we're taking these, learnings and scaling them back to the retail because our stores are still our superpower you know even if online it's, yeah. it's super strong um and then well, your stores and artists right both of those things right that physical presence is a big advantage for you guys exactly and then the the other thing we've we've tried you know obviously strengthen omnichannel capabilities pick up in store buy online like whatever you want you know payment facilitations and all this stuff have been really accelerated during the pandemic. Um, the other thing that we did is social commerce. So social commerce, it's also something that we lean into. We dropped a collection with Rosalia in, um, I think it was early in October, but we dropped that collection early on Instagram, um, Shoppable. Um, so we also have Shoppable Lens on Snapchat. So we're doing a, a bunch of different things to lean into um, uh, the the new modern world that seems to be here to stay um, yeah. and uh, yeah so well I can say one of the things that's really interesting about that right and there's two observations that I think 
I made from what you were talking about, right? So the first one, talking about the technology angle, one of the underrated elements, I think, of being so forward leaning when it comes to technology and these kinds of you know elements is that just from a consumer perception perspective, right? I perceive a brand that is forward leaning from a digital perspective in a very different way than I perceive a brand that's not, right? So regardless of whatever conversions happen from that and whatever measurable results, directly measurable results from a brand equity perspective, right? I view the brand as like young, vibrant, investing in the future, right? So like all of these elements just change the way that I perceive the brand, even if I don't actually end up using the technology, right? Like we had Steve, who was the, um, Steve Lesnar, or Lesnar, who was the uh, CMO at North Face, was formerly SVP of the running group at Nike. And, you know, I use the Nike running app, right? And like, I don't know, I've never bought a shoe because of the Nike running app, right? That, that's going to be directly attributable. But, you know, that changes my perception of Nike. Right. It's like, oh, no, no, this is a technology first, forward leaning digital brand. And so I think it's just such a I just love it. I love that that's working for you guys. Yeah, no. And I I also feel like it's just about being consumer obsessed. Right. Today, we all like. I look at my kids like everybody is in technology in a way of other, you know, in spite of, you know, me like having a no screen (laughs) policy that went out of the windows with COVID, obviously. At home, yep, yep, yep. Um, my kids are extremely technology savvy. I show, I saw them like going from a real classroom to Google Classroom like within two weeks, and sharing yeah. with me how to add a background, how to mute, how to bring somebody in the meeting. And I was like, how? Like they're just. We are investing in technology, but the next generation is not even thinking about being invested in technology. They're just live by it. So I feel like, (laughs) yes, so I feel like for me, like my kids are my focus group. They're like my favorite things to watch. My kids, my, their friends, like this young generation, so inspiring to me, like for what the future is, is going to look like. Um, But it's really, you know, like the fact that we, brands need to behave like we behave, like, like employees behave in their personal life. Right. Like Uh I shop online all the time. I expect a fast delivery. I expect a flawless consumer service. When I go to store, I really want this to be worth my time of like traveling to the store. I think like what, (laughs) what is true for me, it's true for any consumer. So I always tell the teams like, you know, would you, would you, if you want to do something, would you like to share that at the dinner with your friend, like your closest friend? Is it something you can, you think you want to brag about or it's something that you don't want to talk about because you, you're you not like, you're not, you don't think it's cool enough or it's hype enough, you know? So ask yourself yeah. the, the question of like, that you will ask yourself when you're doing, when you are the consumer, when you're shopping, you know? Yeah. And that should be your lens and take risk. We are in the beauty industry. We sell lipstick, you know? It's not, it's, it's okay if we fail. Like, have fun. It's okay. Have fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of people, right, are afraid to fail. And it's understandable, right? It's their jobs. They want to, you know, uh, have a living, et cetera. But I think that um, that is where the magic is, right? Um, and this concept of observation, I think, is like so critical, right? Like thinking of yourself okay, I'm going through this process. How would I feel about this process, right? As well as, and I think this is what's really unique about your background, is because you've operated in so many different regions at so many different brands, like I'm going to list the brands. So there's L'Oreal Paris, Maybelline, The Body Shop, Revlon, MAC, Soft Sheen, Carson, Alme, Revlon, I already had that, Neutrogena, Avino, Clean and Clear, Lubiderm, Garnier, Ralph Lauren, Fragrance, Landman Fragrance. And I think I'm probably missing a brand or two, right? And then you've got, so you've got that, you've got all the brands, and then you've got all the countries, right? So you've been in Europe, you've been in Africa, you've been in the US, you're doing global, you've got cultures, languages, whatever, right? I think kind of your superpower is like you had, in order to be successful in all of those different contexts, you had to, um, you had to observe. Right. Because you don't know all those different cultures and all those different brands and all those different communities and all those different things. So the only way that you could be successful 
was to say, hey, what is working here? What are the problems, right? Um, and then adapting from there versus coming in with a playbook. And so um, it's not surprising to hear the way that you approached Mac um, and the fact that that approach has worked well, right? Yeah, um, no, absolutely. I think you nail it over the head. Like, first of all, <laughs> wow, did I work on so many brands? <laughs> It's a lot, right? Like when yeah, you know, put them all I, in a list. It's it's, it's funny like, because you know, like we've almost twenty years of now perspective uh, and full picture. I think that I can say that each of these experiences have been like completely incremental. It's not something I would have said a few years ago because not every mood move I made made sense to me. I had some time yeah. to trust my manager, some of my mentors saying, yes, do this, you know, do that. I was not always convinced myself, um, but it's almost like you, when you're building a piece of like with Legos, like in a dark room and like all of a sudden you light up the room and you look at the, and it looks like a Picasso and you're like, oh, wow, like, it looks perfect, <laughs> you know, uh, but you yeah. trust the process. And I think um, along with the process, I think it's actually the fact that you work on so different so many different categories, you know, it was always beauty, but different categories from makeup to skincare, hair care, styling, hair color, fragrance, different channels, mass uh, prestige, you know, online, pure players, um, different kind of marketing. I started in product marketing. I was very like much like of a product marketer. So between innovation and, you know, like uh, activation and I move into the digital and e-commerce and social and all this stuff. So there is so many um, differences in each of those categories that it actually keeps you on your toes and keep you as a yeah. learner. And I think the few constant are consumer centricity. You know, that's where, yeah. that's how you win. And, um, and I think um, today it's made me like a seasoned marketer. And I think everybody who comes to me and say, what kind of advice would you give me from a career perspective? Trust the process. Don't settle for something that you think make you comfortable. Go do different things and always see how you can be building off your experience. But I think to your point, I'm lucky that I have, I was born in Benin, Western Africa. I moved to Paris when I was 14. I live in different countries. I, 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 I actually label myself as a, always on immigrants, which means mm. that when I get somewhere, I don't know the, the rules. I don't know the codes. There is nobody to explain yeah. to me. The only way I would be able to understand is by listening, observing, asking questions, practicing empathy, and making sure that, you know, I'm always learning and like thinking about like what I can learn from. I never assume anything. And I think that that's my, yeah, you said it, my superpower and I, for the longest time, it felt clunky sometimes, you know, you had to move into a new country or a new company, like you're like, ah, oh. but oh my God, what yeah. a gift, you know, to, um, to say emotionally connected, you know, to your environment and to the people. And, um, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. Um, it's not a, always an easy choice to move your family across the ocean or to decide to completely start your new life with new friends. Um, but, you know, it's, uh, it's, there's a lot of like, for me, a lot of humanity, a lot of richness. I feel alive. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like I'm consistently learning and I'm consistently growing as an individual, as a, as a marketer, as a, a friend, as a leader, yeah. you know. Yeah, I mean, people underestimate, you know, because each one of those was a challenge, right? So you move to a new place, new country, new brand, new this, new that, right? Each time you kind of work through that, right? It's hard and you work and you work and you work and then it like, and then it becomes easier, right? And like, but that's a, that's a skill you build, right? That's a, that's a talent you acquired because you had to, your brain was forced to like work through this barrier over time. Um, and yeah, I think it's just like, it's, uh, it is a superpower. It's really special, right? And so it's just cool. It's cool to see. Um, so let's talk, actually, I'm curious now. So when we first met, right, 
Um, I think some of what you were doing was um, was observing me, right, and observing influencers and trying to learn right about that space because your background had been on the product development side, on the marketing side, but you were really trying to dive in. Um, what have been some of the more surprising learnings for you, kind of coming into this space, especially for a brand like Mac, which is so dominant socially, right? Like, what were some of the things that you you came in and discovered about? I mean, this is if I were to look at the list, the most social brand you've ever worked at, right? Yeah. So, or the most, yeah, uh, dominant one. Um, what were some of your learnings and what, 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 uh, yeah, yeah, talk to me about that. So I think, you know, I've studied Mac from the outside. I was at Laura okay. for 15 years. Mac was our number one competition obsession because they're just dominating the market, very innovative in also the yep. way they're activating the brand and everything. And I never, you know, like uh, I also worked at, you know, J and J, as you said, and uh, and Revlon. Those companies, very differently from Mac, focus on high funnel activation, building awareness, mass media to actually yep. conquer, you know, like the the audiences. Mac yep. is extremely different. Mac business model is based on earned media. That's what mm -hmm. the brand, you know, start with. I mean, the, the, the media model is very unique and I've never worked in a brand like this. Um, that yeah. it, all the brand I've come there because it's, it's where the space is now, like they're where the market has moved, but it was never part of the media model. Mac was never on TV. <laughs> no, I've never seen a Mac ad, right? Like, yeah. Or like a Mac TV ad. Maybe there's been one, but it's not how I think of the brand. Yeah, and the brand has like a top awareness yep. to the intention behind building advocacy is super important. One of the, the purpose of Mac actually has been articulated to me by John Dempsey, which we call the Mac Daddy. John is a <laughs> legend. <laughs> you know, John like is one of the... <laughs> John is one of the few people in the industry I still haven't met. I feel like I need to meet him one day. Oh my and I'll God, call Connor, him him. like when you come to New York, you have, you must, like we, we need to organize something because John is obviously extremely inspiring for what he's done in the industry. He's a legend. He actually helped yep. build Mac to what Mac is today. But he's, after all these years, he still sees the potential and, you know, push the brands and push the teams to continue to elevate what the brands stand for. And that is, for me, it's remarkable. Like the drive, the passion, the vision is a legend, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, you know, I'm a brand equity builder. I really love when I start working on the brand, I love to be able to get people to articulate anywhere they are in the world. What are the brand mission, the values, the purpose, et cetera, et cetera. Mac yeah. can be spelled People can tell you it's about all ages, all genders, all races, you know, all Mac. Um, they're able to tell you that we give back. But I feel like the one sentence that nobody told me that John were able to act, was able to articulate to me was Mac harnesses the power of community to transform society. Mm. Right. And for me, mm -hmm. that is that was like I had the light bulb moment. I was like, that was exactly what I was looking for. Like, how do you pull together the fact that we are earned media driven, that we have an artist community, that we activate our employees to carry and, you know, like um, um, lift our social values, our values. How do you, do you put together the fact that we're doing N NGOs, like a work, like a lot of work with NGOs, like a strong partnership. We have Viva Glam that has raised like half a billion dollars in the past 27 years, um, we have consumer that come to transform the look. How do you put all that together? I was like, wow, that's the sentence. And I'm making this sentence the purpose of Mac moving forward. Just yeah. to tell you that the community with, you know, um, individuality is really what we stand for. And this is not something you can do with mass media. You have to go grassroots. You have to, to get people to, to, to live and to build those communities. Today, it feels super easy. People talk about community. Yes, you have a WhatsApp group. You have your friends on, on your social media, your followers, that's your community. But like, think about it. It's like 37 years ago. 
when everybody was kind of pretty much yeah. apart. Like you had to dial the phone like this to call your friends, making sure that they're at home. Otherwise you, you couldn't even leave a message. Um, 10 years after you could leave, you could leave a message, but you know, and then you have to, t uh, you know, tag, uh, tag them on their, you know, the tango thing that we all had, like in the late nineties to take, to page your friends or things like that. It feels, <laughs> it feels like so revolutionary and it, it is revolutionary and it transcends generation. It's just a culture. It's a culture. Yeah. You know, I love that description. And I think what's weird for me is I didn't really understand the concept of community until maybe two or three years ago. And where I started to understand it, frankly, um, was like through our own company, right? So through our own company, like now that we're like eight, nine, you know, going on almost 10 years in, right? There is like a community, right? There are people that I built relationships with over years and years and years that are really meaningful and deep and beyond just, you know, uh, transactional and business related and, and tribe has as well. Right. And so, and I think that like, until I saw that right firsthand, I didn't quite understand it. Right. I never really quite got it. Um, like I, I, I knew it was important, but I didn't really get it. Um, but you put it in I the name that, of the company. I think that's powerful. Yeah, I mean, it's right. It's like it's definitely something we believed in, right? And it's almost we've almost grown into it in some ways. And then, um, and then I think secondarily, what's really interesting, um, and I've talked is is what makes the internet special, right? Is that it allows people that are physically distanced, but with with the same interests, can, to connect in a meaningful way, right? So like you know, when you were growing up in high school, maybe there was one other person that was really into makeup artistry, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so you only had one other friend that was into what you were doing. But now you go online and it's like, okay, well, there's two people at every high school and there's, you know, 100,000 high schools. So collectively it's 200,000 people. It's a big community collectively across physical boundaries. Um, and so I think you're right that in a lot of ways, because of the evolution of technology, this, this ability to build community around common interests um, is actually just different than it was in the past, right? You couldn't actually do it. And so in a lot of ways, the last 20 years of technology development have played just perfectly into who Mac is, right? And into what that approach is. Yeah. Um, and that's part of the reason that we've seen all of these brands be so successful with like a similar approach, yeah. right? Um, yeah, and I love that. And that's, and that's, just to exactly, and then to, you know, build on what you're saying and answer your question, your initial question is like, when you and I met and we started to speak about, you know, earn media value, I think we were, we're doing great. And yep. you helped me pinpoint opportunities on how to really further accelerate. And I think that that was amazing for me. You know, I remember like, listening to you and like understanding and like making sense of things that I was feeling uh, in a way yep. and, and being able to bring that to the teams. I remember like probably my first week or first two weeks, I didn't take a lot of action before my first, my month three, because I was listening. And, but one of the things I was like, Tim, you need to reinstate this tool at the market level yep. so we know what what needs to be done because if we are serious about earned media and i discovered that i as i worked into mac i knew they were serious about it but i didn't know it was like the business model um yep. i was yep. like okay we need we need to make sure that we look at the kpis from every every standpoint we're the number one brand on social media like in terms of share of voice that is no doubt. And we, we've been consistently number one, I think for the past year, um, yep. it was not the case before. So there's a lot of work that has been done there, but when you look at the total earned media value and what tribe was issuing to us, I was like, okay, these are where the opportunities are, the buckets of, of, um, pockets of, you know, uh, further acceleration and how we can help guide guide our market, even like yep. in the way they structure themselves, you know, because it's so hard. The world of earn today, it's so fragmented. How do you think about a marketing organization that can support that too? It's super important. 
Yeah. I mean, the it's both fragmented and it's enormous, right? You guys have hundreds of thousands. I mean, it's like oh, probably over, close to a thousand pieces of content a day created just in the US, just by influencers, right? Mm -hmm. And every time one of those people talks about you and they, they hear silence on the other end, right? They don't hear affirmation. They don't get a note. They don't get a thank you, a like, or whatever, right? That's a missed opportunity. That's and that's, but that's a totally different scale than you've ever had to deal with as a brand before. Yeah. And so uh, it's just a massive opportunity. It's a huge opportunity for all of us. And we don't want this to be like a bot because there is a lot of solutions you can do to answer people and to make sure. But we also have makeup artists behind, you know, managing our communities. And because we want, if a consumer comes with a question on the makeup look, it has to be authentic. You know, a makeup artist is able to tell you, oh, this lipstick may not work with this. That may be why you're experiencing this problem. Or this shade, can you, you know, DM me so I can help you further? We take all this so seriously. And I think the quality of the response we want to give sometimes, to your point, doesn't always, um, we cannot always like keep up with the amount of content and the success of the brand. So we have to find ways to accelerate and to focus and to make sure that we we continue. I think the team has been like very reactive to that and like understanding where the, you know, the opportunities were and um, it's fantastic. I have a very talented team, very passionate about the brand too. And that makes things super easy. Well, because a lot of them probably came in the same way you did, right? This like very meaningful connection. And I love that idea of employing the makeup artists to help build that community, right? Because they they know everything, right? They can answer it in a way that like you and I couldn't answer mm -hmm. answer the question. Um, I know that that was something that Ilya found to be really successful for them, which Ilya, I think, grew 400% year over year in 2021 or something like that, some crazy number, right? And um, And for them, what they did during COVID was they brought in their whole field staff and had them just directly interacting with customers digitally, right? And managing the communities. And they're like, yeah, that expertise came through and was really meaningful versus, you know, just hiring a customer service representative to answer the questions and give the feedback and whatever. Um, well, we're coming to the end of our time and I want to be respectful of your time. I know you got a lot going on, but I do have one kind of fun end of show question. Um, so, okay. So, we create a lot of content, right? Tribe creates a lot of content. I create a lot of content, right? Like I've got 40 podcasts and I can tell you for sure that my wife has not listened to all of my podcasts, 100%. Otherwise I'd probably get in more trouble, right? So, um, so your husband is an accomplished author. So he has also written several books. And so I am curious, and I don't want to put you on the spot too much, but have you read all of his books? I have. Wow. Okay. <laughs> You're a better wife than, than uh, my create, wife. I would never. I would. <laughs> it doesn't have 40 podcasts. No. It does not have 40 podcasts. That's true. <laughs> so my husband, yeah, my husband is actually working finance, you know, but he has this. Oh. Branch, yeah. So he, he, he writes and he's, you know, very, he's been published and very successful and I'm very proud of, proud of him, but I'm also super proud to see that I'm the first reader. For the most part, like, you ah. know, so that's how. So, if I may rephrase your question, did I read like all the final books? Maybe not. <laughs> 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 but I've read like all the version leading to the final one <laughs> before the editor comes in and like. <laughs> so yes. yeah, I'm not gonna reread it three yes. four times. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's okay. <laughs> I think you're going to pass on that one. I had a feeling you might be first editor. Yeah, and I'm, um, and I'm an avid reader too. So I feel like it's make it easy. You know, uh, I love to read whenever I have yeah. time. So my new, reading my new reading technique is I buy it. So I used to always do books only, right? But then uh, in the vein of technology, I uh, started doing audiobooks. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, this is great. Like, I really like these audiobooks. But then it's hard to keep track of where you are in the book, right? Yeah. And so then I was like, oh, if I do it on a Kindle, they like sync, yeah. right? So I listen to the book on audio, on audio, put it down. And then at night I pick up the Kindle and it takes me right to where the audio was, right? Ah. And I think having both the visual and the auditory, like it just sticks better because mm -hmm. you hear voices, you have the whole thing. Um, I like have burned through books so much more quickly recently. 
And I think before, before I had kids, I had more time to read. And so now I've had to adapt in order to make that happen. And, yes, uh, and I appreciate you so much for taking out the time. I know I learned a lot and congratulations on all the success that you've achieved um, both at Mac and before Mac. And uh, yeah, thanks so much. And I'm excited to see what you do with the brand over the next few years. It's going to be, it's going to be special. Thank you. Thank you for your partnership. I think you, you've been like probably one of the most insightful um, platform that I've brought into Mac, uh, you know, in my first hundred days, like to help recalibrate exactly where I felt like the opportunities were. So like you, I don't know if I ever told you that, but you were probably like the, the, the biggest source for me, like of like, okay, try to calibrate. So thank you for that. I don't know if people tell you that, but it's very valuable and your company is very smart. Tribe dynamic, community based, right? <laughs> Even if you didn't. Yeah, it. totally. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Um, all right, Ada. Thanks so much again. Thank you. See you later. Bye-bye. Hit subscribe now. Earned by Tribe Dynamics. Tribe Dynamics unlocks your social media influencer community. Our platform not only tracks and measures your best influencer relationships, but discovers new influencers to grow your business through earned media. Get started with a demo today at tribedynamics.com. TribeDynamics.com